What's going on guys, my driver 6 and welcome back to another List for Us Lists video. This time we're looking at top 10 heartbreaking stories about serial killers on death row, about killers on death row. Number 10. Joe Ardy, the happiest prisoner on death row. Joe Ardy, pictured above, pictured to this present here, pictured quite above, was called the happiest prisoner on death row. He had the mental capacity of a six year old, and though he's been told he was going to die for confessing to killing a 15, a 15 year old girl who was actually murdered by a man named Frank Aguilar, he never seemed to fully understand. Ardy passed the time waiting for his execution, playing with children's toys. His favourite was a toy train the wooden had given him, and he didn't understand that where he was going, he wouldn't be able to take it with him. He made, he made that clear when the man in the cell next to him, Andrew Agnes, asked him, When you go, Joe, you would give me your train, wouldn't you? Joe Ardy shook his head, No. He told his son, I take my train with me. He changed his mind a little, a little later after the one named going to Agnes' cell so, and played trains them. The childlike Ardy was touched by the play date. When it was over, he promised, If I go, yes, I can give my train to you, give my train to Agnes. But he still didn't understand what was coming. Up to the right end, Joe, was, Joe insisted everyone else was just confused. When his mother hugged him one last time, he just stared at her blankly. Yes, shaking at that. He couldn't understand why she was so upset. As the guards led him to the gas chamber, Aradee still didn't seem to fully understand what was coming. Number 9. George Stinney Jr., the youngest boy on the electric chair. The police department in Columbia, South Carolina had to deal with a, deal with a difficult call one day in 1944. Two young girls, one eleven and the other only eight, had been found dead in a ditch, beaten to death with an iron pipe while they were picking wildflowers. Now they were going to call for an old woman whose fourteen old grandson had just told her that he was the one who did it. That boy was name that boy's name was George Stinney George Stinney Junior. And when he came in he he directed them to the murder weapon. I'm really sorry. Stinney told the police. I didn't want to kill them girls. Stinney's trial only lasted two hours and today some people insisted insisted he was framed. Either way he was only fourteen years old, the youngest American sentenced to death in the twentieth century. After spending eighty one days in a prison cell eighty kilometers fifty miles out of town, chosen out of fear that that, that the people would lynch the where they would find them. Young George Stinney was taken to the electric chair. The boy was so short that they had to sit him on a Bible to reach the headpiece and the straps were too big for him in place. He, he convulsed violently while the electric shock entered his body. Before he died his mask fell off, revealing his tearful face to the crowd. Stinney was exonerated in 2014. It was con it, it was concluded that his confession was coerced and that he was wrongfully convicted without a fair trial. Number eight, Christopher Newton, the man who wanted to die. At 120 kilograms, 265 pounds, Christopher Newton weighed so much that his executioner couldn't find a vein on his arms. He sold for more than two hours trying to kill Newton. At one point, even giving him a bathroom break while he tried to figure it, while he tried to figure it out. It was the longest lethal injection in history, and had the most eager victim. Newton, after a hard and unhappy life, had had deliberately gotten himself sent sent to prison by leaving. I was ring at. Sorry, guys, most of Edge just decided to have a heart attack and die. We'll continue from number nine, from where we left off. Newton, 
hard and unhappy life had deliberately got himself sent to prison by leaving a child of evidence at the scene of his breaking. Once there, he made it. He made a point to get on death row. He killed a cellmate over nothing, slamming his head onto the floor, stopping his throat, strangling him, and laughing while the officers pulled him away. When they interrogated him, he refused to answer any questions until he made one promise: that they'd give him the death penalty. When the moment came, Newton was almost happy. For his final statement, he joked that he could sure go for some beef stew, and he laughed while his executioner struggled to get the needle into his veins. It took ten tries to kill Christopher Newton. Finally, after two hours, the executioner got the needle, got the needle into his veins and sent poison rushing in to end his life. Number seven, Ricky Ray Rector, the man who saved his last meal for later. Ricky Ray Lecter spent his life moving in and out of jail cells until 1981, when he ensured he'd never move out one again. He'd gotten into a fight over the three-dollar cover charge at a dance club, and in temperamental Ricky pulled, his, pulled out his gun and shot three people. One of his bullets took his target in the head. Ricky ran for his life, but his family managed to convince him to turn himself in. He waited for the police to come and pick him up. Then, when they arrived, he put his gun to his head and pulled the trigger. The gunshot was supposed to come, but it didn't work. Instead, Ricky lost about one third of his brain. He effectively gave himself a lobotomy. Ricky had the mind of a child after that. He would scream when lights went out, terrified of the dark. He would badger people with questions about dogs. He would hop on his bed, telling people he was hunting Indians. I would insist that the guards were getting live alligators into his cell. In his last moment came Ricky Ray Rector ordered, ordered steak, fried chicken, and pecan pie. He left the pie behind. He was saving it. He told the guard to cut off his execution for later. Number 6. Rudolf Tyner, the man who was killed on death row. Rudolf Tyner found himself in a cell next to, next to Donald Henry Gaskins, a man known as the meanest man in America. Gaskins was a serial killer who had killed 13 people, including a pregnant mother. Gaskins was a monster. But now that Tyner was on death row, Gaskins was the closest thing he had to a friend. Off the table! Off! Tyner had earned his cell in a, in a robbery gone wrong. At 18 years old, he tried to rob a grocery store run by an elderly couple. When the man, Bill Moon, refused to hand over the money, Tyner tried to scare him. If I shot Moon in the arm, Tyner later said he thought I would get some money. He fired his one shot, but accidentally killed Moon. When Moon's wife started screaming, Tyner killed her too. Tyner was picked up later that night and confessed to what he'd done. Now he was on death row next to a cold blooded cold blooded Sirica. He was offering to be his friend. I mean to Tyner. Gaskins was putting his death. Gaskins gave Tyner a radio speaker that he said would then talk between the cell between the cells. Tyner, unaware he was hiding a plastic case full of C4 explosive and desperate for someone to talk to, held it up to his ear. His new friend hit the trigger, the bomb exploded, and Tyner died a gruesome death. Police later found out that Moon's son had given Gaskins the, the explosives and paid him to kill Tyner. Gaskins, though, probably would have done it for free. He took pleasure in the story, in the story of how he'd killed Rudolf Tyner, telling people the last thing he heard was me laughing. Number five, Randy Wools, the addict who helped his executioner find a vein. Randy Wools had been a drug addict since he was 13 years old. He'd been injecting things into his veins his whole life, and he brought it to an end after filling them full of Valium. 
while well, in his words, flip down, flip down on drugs, walks onto a drive-in movie theater and beat the ticket seller with an iron, with a tire iron. Then he slit her throat, piled everything in a booth on top of her, and set it all on fire. When he was arrested, he had no memory of doing it and no idea why he done it. Saying, "Only I was out of my mind." That was enough of a defense, though, to keep him off death row. He dedicated his last words to the, to the woman he killed. I'm sorry for the victim and family, he said. I wish there was something I could do to make it all right. After years of drug abuse, his veins were so collapsed that the technicians struggled to find a place they could, they could inject him. They experienced wolves, though Kenny gave him a hand. He helped them find the right place and helped them ease in the needle. In the needle that ended his life. Mark Stroman, the killer whose victim tried to save his life. Mark Stroman was, by his own description, a white supremacist. After 9/11, he, he felt he had a he. After 9/11, he felt he had a patriotic duty to go on a killing spree, so he grabbed a gun and started calling himself the Arab Slayer. He killed his first victim on September 15, 2001, shooting a Pakistani man in a grocery store. Then six days later, he went in. He walked into a convenience store and shot Reis Wuyan, a Muslim from Bangladesh, with a, with a shotgun. Wuyan survived, and the police managed to capture Stroman, but not before he killed again. When he was arrested, he was unapologetic. He called himself a patriot and faced death row, believing he was, that he was a hero. Reis Wuyan had a win and die. His Muslim faith, he felt, required him to forgive Stroman and to do everything he could to save his life. So he started a petition and filed a lawsuit to try and get the man who shot him in the face with a shotgun off death row. Stroman and Wian exchanged those. Stroman, saying that the man he'd tried to kill was attempting to save his life, said that Wian had told him not to hate, who was facing his death more content than he had ever been. For all Wayne's efforts, he, he wasn't able to save Stroman's life. For his last words, though, Stroman told the world what Wayne had told him. Hate causes a lifetime of pain. Brandon Road, the death row prisoner who wasn't allowed to commit suicide. On the day he was scheduled to die, Brandon Joseph Road smuggled a razor blade into his cell. He wanted, to, he wanted to decide how, how he ended his own life. He told his summit he didn't want to be put down like a dog. And so, on the day he was to be executed, he hid, he hid under his blanket and slashed his arms and neck. When the guards realised what was happening, he rushed to rescue him. He was already unconscious and bleeding out fast, but he rushed him to, to, to the hospital and patched him up. He suffered serious brain damage, but they were, but they were able to save his life. Then a week, he was healthy enough to move. And so, one week after Road had tried to kill himself, the men who had refused to die poured him into the execution chamber. Less than seven days before he did his life, also now, also that now they could inject a little drugs into his veins. Philip Brockman, the man who gave his last meal to the homeless. Philip Ray Workman was still holding up a Wendy's fashion when the police arrived. He tried to make a break for it, but a police officer named Ronald Oliver managed to tackle him. Workman, though, fought back. In the scuffle, he shot Oliver in the chest, killing an officer of the law. In a way, he'd killed himself too. By killing a policeman, Workman had ensured his seat on death row, and there wasn't much chance of getting out. The only thing Workman could do was leave a small amount of good in the world before he died. He asked the guards to give his last money to a homeless person. He wanted a vegetarian pizza, he said. But he didn't want it for himself. He wanted them to give it to someone who would could who could really use it. The guards had refused. Workman wasn't able to have to have anyone before he died before he died alone. When a woman named Donna Spangler had a story of her, she insisted on making sure Reverend got his redemption. She raised funds and donated 150 pieces to a rescue mission on Workman's behalf. 
Philip Rogan was trying to do a good deed, she believed, and no one would help him. And finally, number one, Ted Bundy, the monster with a mother. Ted Bundy's name is synonymous with evil. He killed dozens of women, ultimately meeting his end after killing a tiger child. No one in the world felt sorry when he died except for his mother. Bundy's mother Louise was a church going woman, and like any mother, she loved her son. She refused to believe that he'd done what everyone said, insisting, insisting that Ted Bundy does not go around killing women and little children. After her son confessed, though, and mountains of, mountains of evidence piled up against him, it became harder and harder for her to cling, on, to, cling to the belief that her little boy was innocent. innocent. Still, she stood up for him until, until her last days, complaining that it made him seem like more of a monster than he really was. On the day of his execution, Ted Bunny's mother called him twice. She got in her last few words of his son, the little boy who'd gone into one of the most infamous serial killers in the world. Then she called him again, determined to tell him one last thing. They were the last words she would ever say to her little, to her little boy. Will always be my precious son. That's it for the end of this video. If you guys liked it, give it a give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to my main channel and my second subscribe to this channel, and my second channel, my job six vlogs. Click the notifications, click the notification bell on both my channels. See when my videos come up, so you get a first notice of when my videos come up. Don't forget to put a comment if you want me to do more of these series. If this video gets, I say 10 likes, so if this video gets 10 likes, I'll do another video. And that video's title would be 10 Young People Who Murdered Their Parents. So, if you guys like this video, so peace. So yeah, if you guys enjoyed this video, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up, and peace.